Well, we're kind of back where it all started, right? All the way back in February, after Valentine's Day that Sunday, all the way back at the Sea of Galilee, another name for the Sea of Tiberias. Peter and his disciples fishing, or at least trying to. They didn't have much luck. Sounds familiar, right? It takes us back to that first encounter that we read about in the Gospel of Luke as we started our Lenten time together and started our wandering alongside of Peter. In the Gospel of Luke, in that fifth chapter, where Jesus calls the first disciples, where he got in the boat after a long night of failing to catch any fish, and he told Peter, who was known as Simon at that time, he hadn't yet been given the nickname Peter by Jesus, his rock. Jesus told Simon and James and John to cast their nets in really deep, even though they've been trying to catch fish all night. And so they threw the nets over one more time, and they caught so many fish that their nets began to break similar to what we've just heard this morning. Now, as we've been wandering besides Peter, we've been jumping around the Gospels. I don't know if you caught that or not. Did anybody catch that? I see if yeah. Oh, lots of heads raised. Good, you're paying attention. <laughs> we started out in Luke, like I just said. We spent some time, quite a few weeks in Matthew, and then popped back into John and back to Luke, and now we're wrapping things up with the Gospel of John. It's a bit like the, uh, the Marvel Universe. Same character, different stories, different movies. It's not exactly the same in each movie or in each Gospel. And although Peter's story doesn't end here, this is just part one, we will be finishing our time, at least for now, with Peter today at the encounter of the risen Christ. I know a couple of churches that are launching into 10 more weeks of Peter. Peter part two. You're welcome. We won't be doing that. I love Peter, but I think it's time for us to explore some other things as well. You know, so much has happened since that initial boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. It's a little surprising, in fact, that we find the disciples there again today. It's as if they've simply returned to their old lives. Or maybe they've been asking themselves the question some of us might be asking this first Sunday after Easter. Now what? But how can they go back to the way things were? How can we go back to the way things were? I understand why they might fall into those familiar patterns. They're scared. They're, sa they're, they're sad. They feel lost. It's easy. It's easy and it's natural to go back to the familiar. And there's goodness in the familiar. There's goodness in the things that we know, things that almost come second nature to us. But they've forgotten their greater mission. Or maybe they're just not up for it anymore. Maybe they felt like they've lost their leader, and, and what can they do now? But Jesus' appearance at the shore reminds them that they can't go back to what they know. They can't forget his teachings. They can't forget his commandments. They can't return to the way things were. They can't return to how they've always done things. In John's gospel, resurrection doesn't mean resuscitation. 
Jesus is back. But if you caught it in the story, they didn't immediately recognize him. They didn't uh, recognize him when they saw him. They didn't even recognize him when he asked them how their night of fishing went, even though he knew the answer. It wasn't in his appearance or in his voice. It was in the catching of the fish. And once again, Jesus invites them to share a meal along the shore, just as he did when he broke bread and shared fish in the feeding of the 5,000. And we also see parallels of this story of what happened during Holy Week. Jesus calls the disciples children, just as he did on the night when he washed their feet. Jesus feeds them around a charcoal fire, which mirrors the one that Peter stood beside when he denied Jesus three times. And by coming to the disciples at the beach, Jesus has kept his promise to not ab abandon them. It's like he's really trying to get across the point that it's me. I'm here. You know me. Remember the things that we've experienced together. Remember the things that I have taught you. Remember what I have called you to do. You think Peter would be overjoyed, right? I mean, we talked about that last week. How hopeful he was, how excited he was that the tomb was empty. And now that the risen Christ is right in front of him, we don't get that same sense of joy. Maybe he keeps thinking about the last time that he was around Jesus, when he denied him, denied knowing him again and again and again. Maybe he's ashamed or embarrassed or unsure of, of what to say or what to do. He's hurt someone that he loves. What do you do when that happens? Is Jesus mad at him? Is he disappointed? Does he still want to be his friend? Does he trust him? When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Simon Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And then he asked him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. And he asks a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was sad that Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed me my sheep and follow me three times peter denied him and three times the risen christ asked do you love me jesus doesn't yell or scold him there's no berating or judgment he gives peter the opportunity to express his true feelings, to express his love. God's grace is on full display here. And the risen Christ is helping Peter move past his guilt and his shame. 
This is a time of deep healing for their friendship, for their relationship. That word love there, that first time Jesus asks it, it means agape, talking about the divine love. But the last two times, it's philo, as in brotherly love. This situation speaks to the depth of their relationship, to a trust that has been rebuilt. It's as if Jesus is helping Peter move forward into his true calling of being the rock on whom his church will be built. It's as if he's saying, this isn't about your fears or your failures. Do you love me? Are you sure? Are you positive? Okay. Then feed my sheep. Step up and get to work. I believe in you. I always have. Put your love in action. This is what it's all about. It's not about getting to heaven when we die or converting people to a certain religion. It's about caring for one another. It's about feeding each other spiritually and quite literally physically. If you love me, make that love tangible and go and care for those that I love. I remember Years ago, I read a book by Sarah Miles. Some of you, I think, are familiar with it, Take This Bread, A Radical Conversion. Sarah Miles uh, pastored a church for a long time in the Mission District, but before that, she was a reporter, didn't grow up around religion, and she was drawn into St. Gregory's, where they had a program that feeds people weekly in their sanctuary. They moved their pews, and around the communion table, they set up food. And people come in, and they go around in a circle, just like they circle up around that communion table on Sunday mornings. And in her book, when they were working on developing this program and, and doing different things, she said what kept coming to my mind again and again and again was that Jesus said, Feed my sheep. sheep. Feed my sheep. He didn't say, feed my sheep after you check their ID. Or feed my sheep after you make them worship with you. Or feed my sheep only if they believe a certain thing, or look a certain way, or love a certain person. He just said, feed my sheep. You know, as I read that story this week, I can't help but look at it and think about World Central uh, Kitchen. World Central Kitchen prides themselves in being the first on the front lines, providing fresh food and meals to humanitarian and climate and community crises. And we saw what happened this past week. People, I don't know their religious background, but they literally took this message of feed my sheep and they were out there feeding God's sheep. In their own words, food is an essential part of every life all over the world, every single day, and it is more important than ever in a crisis. Not only is it thoughtful, is it freshly prepared meal, one last thing that people have to worry about in the wake of a disaster, it is a reminder that you are not alone. Someone is thinking about you. Someone cares. Food has the power to be the nourishment and hope we need to pick ourselves back up in the darkest of times. Feed my sheep. World Central Kitchen was there when Hamas attacked the music festival and took hostages and killed people. They fed families all across Israel after October the 7th. 
And right now they're doing all they can to feed families in Gaza. And working and praying and hoping for relief, for food, for aid, for a ceasefire to happen. So that people can be restored to wholeness. So that families can be reunited with their loved ones who have been taken hostage. So that the killing can stop. We've seen the healing power of food in our own lives. When we've gathered at this table, when we've shared in a potluck after our Wednesday night worship service. Or maybe when someone has brought you a casserole when someone's been sick or created a, a meal train when you've been in the hospital or have had a new baby. Food heals. And I think that's why Jesus gives these instructions. This is the very end of the Gospel of John. Feed my sheep physically and spiritually. Food nourishes our souls. And when we are fed, when we are nourished, we want to go forth and feed and nourish others as well. It's this chain of healing and restoration that's contagious. You know, this afternoon, after our worship service, we have a time, we will have a time to ask these questions and what they mean, what it means to follow the risen Christ, what it means to tend my sheep and feed my lambs when we begin our discernment process. A congregational-wide spiritual journey where we will look at who God is calling us to be as a community of faith, focusing on our Latino and our multicultural ministry. Our discernment process will be an extension of our worship service, where we will quite literally sit down and break bread together, both in the form of communion and in lunch. Christ is risen. Now what? What are we going to do as we move forward and celebrate and share and spread this good news? You know, despite Peter's wandering and wavering and shortcomings, Jesus believed in him, calls him again, and sends him forth. Put your love in action for me. We can't give up caring for one another. We must keep asking ourselves what kinds of actions and communities can we build that feed my sheep and tend my sheep when we feel afraid or insecure or simply exhausted. How will we resist turning or returning to what we've always done and instead choose to follow the risen Christ. To answer Jesus' call to share what we have and to fight for justice so that all may eat. To take seriously the call to ensure that those who hunger for spiritual nourishment have access to communities that are healthy and healing and liberating, fighting against toxic theologies that destroy to follow in the ways of Jesus, the one who taught us to live. It's risky. It's countercultural, and at times it is dangerous. It's not an easy task. Stepping up so that God can love the world through us, but it's who we are called to be, and it's what we are called to do as followers of the risen Christ, as Easter people. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. 
Do you love me? Follow me. Amen.